The way I'd summarise it is you'd use clarity and imagination, clarity to report the facts, imagination to bring fresh new ideas, and that then builds, ho builds hope in what is a quite hopeless time otherwise. We've moved into an era uh, where it's being proposed that truth no longer matters in politics. Now, if you're talking about in our system of government, a constitutional republic built on the principles of freedom and democracy. It's absolutely essential, it's imperative that you have this communicable trust between the leadership and that. But we have had for well now over half a century a diminution of that. And now we've reached the point where even some of the most respected public journals are talking about we're in an era of post-truth politics. I certainly pray that's not so. I actually think that journalism is facing a crisis um, that is something akin to the climate crisis that we're facing, except for instead of ordinary earthbound ecosystems, it involves our information ecosystem. Um, this, this, this crisis is really unprecedented and it um, threatens the sustainability of free societies all over the world. The Industrial Revolution produced all kinds of growth and amazing um, progress for humanity, um, but it also left us with a broken planet. Um, and I think that the Digital Revolution has brought lots of amazing growth and our, our profession has um, really thrived in terms of being able to spread the journalism much more easily than we used to, but um, we also have a huge problem problem of information pollution and uh, fake news is, is, is just one part of that. So, so I think we're really facing a systemic crisis and that crisis extends also to our ability to monetize the work that we do. During Watergate, uh, it was viewed as a partisan investigation by the press. Uh, our approval ratings were exceptionally low uh, and then it turned out that that reporting was validated uh, at the end uh, and the president uh, Nixon had to, had to resign and approval ratings for the press shot up, uh, probably to the highest level we'll ever see, which is probably in the mid-50s, uh, because somebody is always upset with us for some, one reason or, an, or another. Uh, but uh, the reporting was validated, and I'm absolutely confident that the reporting we're doing today will be validated over the long run, and I take the long view. Uh, you know, I think uh, often uh, people who are voiceless, uh, people who are victims of wrongdoing, uh, they might make us feel certain emotions, which is natural. They might make us feel uh, anger. And I think uh, it's appropriate to let that anger uh, drive us uh, to get to the bottom of the story and get to the truth. I don't know if you've seen the, the movie Spotlight, but, but there is a wonderful scene where you see us uh, constructing a database uh, of priests who we believed were suspect. We kind of figured out that in the annual Catholic Church directories, certain priests had strange sounding assignments like uh, sick leave or or, or a special assignment or emergency response. And we figured out that those were euphemisms for priests who had been accused of sexually abusing children and had been put on the shelf in one way or another. So uh, as you see in the movie, if you see the movie, we, we went through all the church directories going back 20 years uh, by, by hand, literally, uh, finding every single priest with a, with a funky sounding assignment. And we uh, put them into a spreadsheet and we did histories on every single one, the various parishes. Uh, where they'd worked, and it ended up being a terrific uh, guide to our work. It was a very, very involved process, so sometimes uh, getting to the truth of a story involves uh, building your own database, creating your, your own uh, uh, work of reference. I think we need to be much more diverse to represent the societies we report on, um, otherwise we're going to be uh, alien and in some weird separate bubble. Uh, we need to be meaningful. I think um, the, the way the digital revolution has impacted on a lot of journalistic organisations has led them to doing kind of mass clickbait, uh, misrepresenting stories, doing headlines that don't tell the truth, um, and then not making phone calls, just churning out, look, there's this phrase, journalism, not journalism, um, and I think you ha we have to step back from that and do something meaningful and the way you do that and that's the fifth principle is that you report fairly on people as well as power reporting is the main thing that journalists do that is very hard for other people to do because it's so labor intensive um, and so difficult and complicated um, and while the world is awash with opinions and and uh, made up stuff we can report we can go on the ground and we report, can report both on the powerful and the impact on people that those decisions and powerful people make have you think about it in a certain way it is really the success of like the primacy of the question over the answer. I mean, season one is like a 10-hour <laughs> audio documentary about a 15-year-old murder I did not solve. 
right? And it's like you know, millions and millions and millions of downloads, right? So I, I don't know. I feel like I'm driven by my personal confusion as a, as a reporter. Like the more confused I get, I feel like, okay, now I feel like I'm getting somewhere. Um, and, and I'm sort of okay living with that uncertainty. But I feel like there's this urge to be like so declarative all the time um, about like, here's what I think and here's what you should think, you know? And I don't feel that way. I always feel like, how does anyone know what they think? Like the wor it's very complicated, our world. And so like, I feel like, so happy if people are starting to ask the same questions I'm asking about basically like our country, right? Our democracy, like what about the criminal justice system? Why are we sending people to Afghanistan? You know, like if, if regular people like me can start asking those questions instead of just looking for an answer or, or something to grab onto and, and repeat, I feel like, yay, we have done our job. <laughs> well, what about the incurious? And aren't those the people who actually most, most desperately need to be informed. And the vector through which those people had once been informed was often through local news. And there's been this tremendous collapse in local news, as I was saying earlier. Um, you know, you switch on your local television news to figure out what's going on with the traffic. And then in the middle, you'll see a report about, um, you know, the mayor and the, um, you know, whoever it is that's um, the corrupt cop that was just, uh, just brought down and busted. All of that ecosystem created, all of that created an ecosystem that engendered a certain amount of trust and confidence in the community. And what you've seen is in um, places where, uh, where there's been a reduction in local reporting, you have uh, lower voter turnout, lower voter participation, you have fewer candidates standing for public office. So of course, I didn't think all of this just immediately right off the top of my head when I made the decision that I was gonna make this switch. But I think very much in the back of my mind was this idea that um, it's an unhealthy world where it's a kind of winner take all. And if you only have you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and a handful of cable news organizations, and with this shift towards, towards uh, consumer revenue, meaning subscriptions and, and, and paywalls, um, I was deeply concerned about the notion that high quality news would essentially only be available to those who could pay for it. I think people in our newsroom are more animated, more motivated than they've been in a, in a long time. Uh, they feel that they play a very important role uh, in covering this government and covering our politicians and our policymakers. And what we're hearing from the American public, notwithstanding polls like that, what we're seeing in our subscriptions, what we're seeing in terms of uh, traffic to our sites, all of that, uh, we're seeing that people have begun to appreciate the role of a, the press in a democracy in a way that they have not in a very, very long time. Uh, for so long, the American pr public has taken it, the press for granted. They haven't really understood our role in the democracy. They didn't really support us. Now what we're seeing is a huge increase in subscriptions, for example, to the Washington Post, for uh, because they want to support quality journalism. They're concerned about uh, about people who are spreading absolute falsehoods. They're concerned about people who are trafficking in conspiracy, uh, crackpot conspiracy theories. And they know that if they don't actually support quality journalism, there will be no quality journalism. We're, we're in a whole new cosmos, journalists. And the idea of, it always has to be equivalency, that if you run a story on candidate A, you have to run an equal link story on candidate B. And if you lead the newspaper or the newscast one day with candidate A, you must lead it the next day with candidate B, is not serving the public very well. And there is, and I do not exclude myself from this criticism, that journalism needs a spine transplant. Uh, it requires some guts to, to say, when something is demonstrably a lie, when there's no question about it, that it be called a lie. Uh, there's always a great, has been a great reluctance to do that, including my own reluctance to do that. And that also to ask the tough follow-up question, which this is a large subject which we don't have time to get into, but every journalism needs access. So too often you say, I sh I'm sitting here with you on a television program, and I know the tough question to ask you, but I know if I ask you that question, you're not going to appear on my program again. Okay. So in answer to your question, I do think it's time for journalists to, to have some courage, if you will.